Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, you never saw it coming. Welcome, Genies. You have found us. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth, and this is the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this segment of the show is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. First of all, we got to welcome our latest radio affiliate to our Extreme Genes Network, KAVB Radio, 98.7 FM in Hawthorne, Nevada. Thrilled to have you here. In fact, I have some family history there. My great uncle Oscar Olson lived there for many years, died in the 1950s. So if you run across his grave, give him a little shout out from me, okay? Hey, we also want to welcome our patron club members. These are the people who support the show for pretty much the cost of a hamburger each month. We give you all kinds of benefits. We give you bonus podcasts. We give you early access to our current podcasts. We even do a live Ask Us Anything YouTube feed, and uh, we'd love to have you be a part of that. Just sign up on the Patrons Club link at ExtremeGenes.com or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. And some of our latest members include Anissa Hack and Michelle Ritchie, and I love this name, Simona McAngus. So grateful you guys are coming on and supporting the show. And our guest today, we're going to be talking to the recent past Governor General of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. Her name is Lee Sinclair Filson. And with Thanksgiving upon us, you know, we often think about those pilgrims and the changes they brought to this continent and the world. We're going to talk about that, how to join the big anniversary celebration coming up in 2020. And we're also going to talk to Suzanne Earnhardt. She is with LegacyTree.com talking about day registers. Wait till you hear about these. It involves your English research. That's coming up just a little bit later on in the show. And in the studio with us, once again, twice in a row, it is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, David Allen Lambert. To what do we owe the pleasure? Uh, my plane got delayed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see you again, my friend. Well, it's a pleasure to be here once again. Well, for our family history news, we're going to start over in Scotland. And I know it's a little late and past Halloween, but of course, everyone always is excited when they find a witch in their family tree. Yes, yes. And this time, they're actually using 3D technology to bring back the face of a witch. Now, as you may know, witches in Europe were burned. Well, this one didn't get burned. This was Lilius Addy of Toryburn, Scotland. She was accused of being a witch for having relationships with the devil. Ooh. She was in jail. She was going to be burned the next day, but she suffered maybe a heart attack or maybe it was suicide, but found dead in her cell. And so she wouldn't be raised up again to haunt the neighboring villages. Her body was buried under a heavy stone on a beach. And in the 19th century, they dug her up. 20th century, her skull disappeared, but not before someone photographed it. And with that photograph, they brought her face back to life. Wow. That is so cool. Modern technology. So the witch is back to haunt us. Exactly. <laughs> well, our next story goes a little further southeast. This goes out to the Giza pyramids, the great pyramids out in Giza, Egypt, where they have used muons. What? A muon? What's that? It's using the byproduct of cosmic rays to penetrate into solid objects. And they've able to determine, Fish, that there is actually a hundred foot passageway in the pyramid they never knew was there. Really? So this is something that could be loaded with artifacts, perhaps dealing with one of your Egyptian ancestors, David. Exactly. Well, maybe one of your Egyptian ancestors, yes. Fish. <laughs> it's the same technology that the government uses to find caves over in Afghanistan for the U.S. military to protect our veterans over there when they're on missions. In Illinois, our next story is about a 13-year-old young man named Andrew Mann, who is very interested in local history, and he has been volunteering at a local heritage center there. He wants to be a lawyer and a politician. Oh, who would want to do that? I don't know. Another <laughs> Illinois person had a pretty good career with that. His name was Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, I think so. You're I'll right. tell you, when we were kids, genealogy was the hobby I had. I never thought about being a lawyer and a politician, but 
Uh, I'm glad I stuck with family history. And this kid is good, by the way. Very, very good. He's very, very good at what he does, and he helps a lot of people when they come in the center. He does it after school as a volunteer, and all the seniors there who volunteer love him to death. It's great fun. Kids really do embrace history and help preserve it. Next up, Harvard University, which, of course, has been around since the 1630s, and they decided to take their 450,000-plus early colonial North American collection and digitize it and put it online for free. They'll be coming up with a new website shortly. Wow, that's cool. 450000 So what does this include? Documents, diaries, ledgers, artwork, things that would tell the story of colonial North America, things that have been under the radar and under the rooftops of Harvard University for well over 350 years. Wow, what a great thing that's going to be. Look forward to the announcement of where we can look at those. We'll update everyone very shortly. This week's Blogger Spotlight goes all the way out to Melbourne, Australia, where O. Wayne Couch has a blog called thegenealogyguide.com. And recently we've been talking about ways to get kids interested in genealogy. Well, he must be picking up the psychic wavelengths because he just did a blog on that last week. So how are the kids doing in your family with all the free coins that you're gathering for their ancestors? Well, kind of like you with your daughter, they're going nuts. And Mm -hmm. I got a five-year-old and a three-year-old and a two-year-old. And uh, actually, I posted pictures on our Facebook page recently about it. And what we're doing is they're, they're called Ancestor Birth Year Coins. And we, f- we find a coin from the country and year an ancestor was born and put it in a little book with little pockets in it that you get from a coin store. So we have the picture of the ancestor and the coin together with the year of their birth. And they're loving it because every time they come to visit, I got another one and they fight over who gets to put the coin in the pocket. You know, your system, the way you are put it together is almost the way I did it. Great minds think alike. And remember, <laughs> if you decide that you're going to join American Ancestors, you could save $20 and buy some coins for your grandkids and kids and use the checkout code EXTREME for AmericanAncestors.org to be a member of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Well, I think I'm going to get back to Beantown eventually if my plan works out. And delighted to be in the studio with you, my friend. Take care. All right. Good to see you again, David. And coming up next, we're going to talk to the former governor general of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. What's going on with that organization? How can you be part of it? What's happening with the research? Lee Sinclair Filson will tell you coming up next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that FamilySearch Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Genes, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Genes Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Genes rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members-only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeGenes.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well-known family history experts. Catch visits with Ginny Genealogy stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash ExtremeGenes. 
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, it's that time of year, Thanksgiving, and thinking about the Pilgrims and the Mayflower, and it's Fisher here on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and I have on the line with me right now the recent past Governor General of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. She is Lee Sinclair Filson, and she's from New Orleans, Louisiana. Welcome to the show, Lee. Nice to have you on. Thank you, Scott. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a big fan of your show. You know, you've told me this, and I'm tickled to death that you would be, and we're thrilled to finally get you on. You just left office after three years in September, which gives you a little bit of time, a little more time to maybe spend with us and talk about the Mayflower Society for a lot of people who don't know about it. And I should mention, by the way, I am a member. I'm a John Howland descendant, John Tilly descendant. And we just recently had our fall, what would you call it, the gathering? <laughs> Something like that. Well, I haven't been in it that long. Your, your, yes, your compact day event. Yes. That we do each November. And it was great to be with everybody. And for anybody who's not been at one of these meetings, they get together. We have a great big dinner and we meet all these other descendants of the Mayflower. And they do what's called a roll call where you go through and say, all right, all descendants of John Alden, please rise. All descendants of John Howland, please rise. And they they actually take account of how many people. We actually had somebody in there, by the way, Lee, who was a descendant of Miles Standish, which isn't really very common, right? No, it's not. That's, that isn't very common. And, and that's wonderful that you had a Standish descendant there. It's interesting because if you read about Miles Standish, the story was is that he had a very large head, and the guy who yes. was at the meeting had a very large head. But he, he wasn't redheaded, and he certainly didn't seem very aggressive as, uh, well, as know, his forefather was. He also had red hair, and he also was very short, and they called him Captain Shrimp. Was this guy short with red hair? <laughs> he was not short. He just had the big head. And I was looking and studying him going, huh, he does look like he could be. Well, and as you know, you never know which of those genes you're going to get. So he must have gotten that big head gene. Yeah, could very well be. There was also a John Billington descendant there, and of course, he was usually called America's first murderer, right? Yes, it did and the Billington descendant actually admitted it, huh? Yes, yes, he rose, and everybody just kind of <laughs> glared know, at him. You should mention that, because at Congress this year, the Billington descendant stood up and gave a very impassioned speech saying that they're tired of being called murderers, and they're tired of being disparaged in that way, that, that none of us really know if that really was the case, and they created their, the very first Billington Family Society this past September. Wow. All right. Well, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think we all know that we all have things to be ashamed of in, in our past collectively, maybe even individually, yeah. among our ancestors, and we have things to celebrate as well. And certainly we recognize that the Pilgrim's arrival in America is something that many people celebrate, but there are others who look at it in a very negative light, such as many of the Native Americans. That's true. The Native Americans call Thanksgiving Day the National Day of Mourning, and that makes me very sad for a number of reasons, but primarily because the truth is the Pilgrims, the Mayflower Pilgrims and the Wampanoag tribe, are the o th that is the only example in America where a peace treaty was signed and it was honored for 54 years yes. by both parties. They helped each other. They defended each other. It makes me kind of sad that that's the event chosen to represent all of the reprehensible things that happened later. 
You're absolutely right. And I don't think a lot of people understand, because they, they have a general knowledge of the Pilgrim story, that you know things weren't always love and kisses. And especially when we got to 1676, where we had the King Philip's War, and, and they're saying that the King Philip's War wiped out so many people on both sides, the Native Americans and the Puritan settlers, the Pilgrim's descendants. But at the end of the day, it took like a century for the economy to recover from that. And at that point, we're at the Revolutionary War. Yes. There's so much that can be debated on both sides with all varying opinions. But I I like to take it back to families. And the fact of the matter is, it makes me very sad that the Pilgrim Winslow and Chief Massasoit, the tribal leader of the Wampanoag tribe, were able to forge such a peace and to continue it for 54 years. What makes me sad is that it was their grandsons and great-grandsons that eventually went to war later. It's a shame that they weren't able to continue that level of peace. It might have changed the history of the way the Native Americans and the Americans were able to get along later. But you have to remember that by that time, there were a lot of other players in the scene. The Winter Fleet had come across, and all of the people in the Massachusetts Bay Colony were not quite as charitable toward the Indians and were not quite as willing to write peace treaties. They really wanted to come to claim land and to build lives and weren't nearly as cautious or careful about that. And then you had tribes working against tribes. So there were so many other things that represented and that were brought into what happened 54 years later. And it's kind of a shame because the one thing that the Mayflower Pilgrims and the Wampanoag tribe will always have is that they set such a great example of how parties should help each other. I'm sure that it was probably not a warm and fuzzy piece, although you have to admit it must have not been too terribly bad because there were three days of harvesting and three days of a harvest festival in which the Wampanoag tribe joined the Mayflower Pilgrims, and that's where Thanksgiving came from. But still, you know, I'm sure that they that they really were wary about each other, but yet they maintained that peace. Well, and it was a very tentative peace because trust took a while. But, you know, what, what a fascinating history. And for those who know that they descend from anybody on the Mayflower, it's really worth your while to look into joining the Society of Mayflower Descendants. It's an interesting group of people who love to share that common heritage, almost like a family, isn't it, Lee? It is, Scott, and believe it or not, for those of you listening, your chances of being a Mayflower Pilgrim are better that you are than you're not. And the reason for that is that in America today, over 10 million of us are descended from the Mayflower. All you have to do is just find the lines. And if you don't find it from your parents, it may be from the four grandparents or the eight great-grandparents. We know that if you'll go back probably around 32 grandparents, your chances are better than not that you're going to find that line. So truly, that's why we tell everybody over and over, the Mayflower Pilgrims truly are America's family. Absolutely true. And, you know, I look at this and I think, first of all, you guys have made it so easy for people to link in comparatively. And that is because over the years you put together the Silver Books, which covers the first five generations of Mayflower descendants. So really all you have to do is connect back into some where I'd say about what the early 1700s or mid 1700s somewhere in there and the rest is all documented and you know I appreciate the fact that the society has very strict standards in terms of making sure that each generation is proven so that people know first of all that they themselves are truly accepted as being descendants and also that the descendants of us know that it's a fact. In fact, that was one of the main reasons I joined the society was I wanted my children and grandchildren to be confident in that line that it wasn't just a family story. That is all correct, but to lead this right into what you do so well for all of us in talking about extreme genes and in talking about the things that you discuss on your show, to make sure that we remain the gold standard of lineage research, we not only now rely on our silver books and, of course, always rely on that lineal documentation, but we now have a very, very robust DNA program. We were the first genealogy society to accept DNA as a secondary proof in order to prove that you did have Mayflower Pilgrim genes. But 
the way that this is moving, it's truly exciting, the way that it's moving as we dive into the DNA area. Do we see the day when perhaps we're going to be able to recognize a place on a chromosome that indicates, oh, this is a descendant of Samuel Fuller, or this is a descendant of... Well, actually, that day is here. Now, first, let me qualify this by saying, never, ever, ever will you be able to take a DNA test and say, yes, I'm a pilgrim and join. You must have the lineal descent documentation along with it, because without that documentation, DNA is nothing. I mean, you can see something that looks like a a connection, but then you have to figure out where it came from. But truly, we have a partnership with Family Tree DNA, and right now we have just finished identifying and finding direct lines from all of the male pilgrims. We're now working on the females. Wow. That's incredible. (laughs) It is. It's a big deal. I mean, not a lot of people really understand what a big deal it is, but we are so very excited about it. And if you test through FTDNA, through Ancestry, through 23andMe, any place you test, if it looks as though that the match is there, you can load it into the FTDNA Mayflower Project. That's mostly members in the project now, but FTDNA helped us actively go out through their billions of tests and locate and identify direct descents and then talk to those people, of course, getting permission. Most of them have now joined the society, and those who haven't been have the direct lines are in the process. Now, when you talk direct lines, are you saying male to male to male, female to female to female, or everybody in between? I'm talking Standish to Standish to Standish to Standish. Okay. What FTDNA is doing right now is eventually when you test or you upload your information to FTDNA, if it looks as though there's a possible Mayflower line, you'll get a little icon that tells you that so that you can then start to research it, contact the Mayflower Society, and figure out how to start doing the documentation. Isn't that incredible? Thank you so much, Lee. That is incredible. (laughs) She's Lee Sinclair Filson. She is the recent past Governor General of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. Have a great Thanksgiving, Lee, and thanks so much for coming on the show. You too, Scott. Thank you so much. And this segment has been brought to you by LegacyTree.com. And speaking of which, we're going to talk to one of the project managers for LegacyTree.com, Suzanne Earnshaw, coming up next, talking about Dade registers. If you're in English research, wait till you hear about these. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the GrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. (laughs) 
And welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment of our show is brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. And as we talk about, you know, researching your Mayflower ancestors, obviously we got to get back to England. And there are a lot of tricks to dealing with that place because, let's face it, it's not all that easy, not only in England, but in the related countries there in the United Kingdom. One person who came up with a fascinating source that I wasn't aware of, and I should have been, because some of my people are from the place and time it involves. Suzanne Earnshaw is on the line. She's a project manager for LegacyTree.com. And great to have you on the show, Suzanne. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Tell me about the Dade Register. Well, the Dade Register is from England, as you mentioned. It goes back to the point in time where the Church of England ruled everything, and once a year, the bishop of each diocese was required to copy all parish records within the diocese and then send that copy to the records office. The church then stored the copies of the parish records. Well, if the bishop sent the transcripts only as the Church of England wanted them, then it was just simply a copy of basic vital statistics, and they really wouldn't have a lot more added value. But a Yorkshire clergyman named William Dade, who was born about 1740, he had the idea that he didn't want to just capture the information that the church wanted, but he actually wanted to record more information. And some parishes also got on board and decided they would do the same thing. And so around 1770 through about the early 1800s, several parishes made a register and then sent it off to the church diocese. And these became known as the Dade Register, since William Dade was the one who originally started the process. So he wanted extra information in there. This guy stepping up, he was obviously envisioning us one day, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that must be absolutely true. That yes. He knew that yes. sometime we were going to start digging through these records, trying to figure out who our ancestors were. And he decided, hey, I'm not just going to give you a little bit of information. I'm going to give you a lot more. And so he went on to write down things like the birth order of the children, the profession of the dad, where the family resided. He wrote down grandparents as well, wow. which is just amazing, especially maternal grandparents. That's a really hard find in English records. Yes. Now, often we only see the name of the groom and sometimes only the wife's first name, even in the marriage records. Exactly. So to have this wealth of information where you actually have written records of the mother's maiden name and her parents, and often that grandmother is also given the maiden name, just so much information that's available compared to the standard indexes that we often see. Sure. Now now think about this. We're talking 1770, and it goes up to what, about 1812, right? Yes. Yeah, it does. So it's 42 years. I mean, it's the better part of a half a century. And then leading up, of course, to when the census records get on board in the 1840s and 50s. I mean, this is just gold stuff. The problem we have, though, is it is somewhat limited. It's not throughout all of England. That's true. It is really exclusive in time and place. And so there are quite a few shires that did it. Yorkshire, Lancashire, Cheshire, Nottinghamshire, and Surrey. And it's from about the mid-1770s to, as you say, 1812. So it does really help you if you are looking in that time and place. And I am. I'm looking in Nottinghamshire in 1802. And the Fisher name actually comes from Yorkshire in the 1700s. So this could be useful, except for the fact I noticed that my particular parish was not included. Now, it is even limited. It's not universal within the counties, is it? It's not. It is really limited to certain parishes. Not everyone wanted to do it. You know, a lot of the clergymen said, hey, this is more work, and they had big populations, and they didn't want to take on those lengthy recording style, and so they did not participate. If you happen to be in one of these places, you really get some great information. Or even if, let's say, your ancestors moved, and your direct line ancestor wasn't born in one of those parishes, but a sibling or a cousin or something was, that would help you as well. So you could expand out if you needed to, if if there was any chance you could get some of these great records. 
And if not, you can also go through things like probate records, which also give a three-generation view. So there are ways to get good grandparent names if you know how to use some of the English records beyond just what's available through vital records and statistics. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you put them all together, that's when it becomes a real strong case and you can be confident in in where you're going. What percentage of parishes would you say, for instance, within Yorkshire, actually use the Dade registers as opposed to just the standard church registers? Boy, I don't know that I have a a number for you like that because they didn't all conform and and we don't have an exact count at Hmm. this point. But I know that Yorkshire has the biggest selection of what's available, but I just don't know an actual percentage. Okay. So some people did, some people didn't, so it's kind of a crapshoot. But enough did where you really need to find out if these records exist. So where would people go to find the Dade registers? Are they available online? Are they free? Are they uh, for pay? Or is it something you have to actually hire somebody over in England to look it up for you? Those are great questions. A lot of them are available for free. They have been put online. It's called the Online Parish Clerks. It's on their website. And so if you type in, like, for instance, my family's from Lancashire, so if I type in Lancashire Online Parish Clerks, it takes me to a website, which is actually lan-opc.org.uk. And then it welcomes me to the page and, and lets me go ahead and begin searching for those online parish clerk records. And to do that, it gives you a register for baptisms. You have to remember that although these areas are very small, for instance, when I look for things I'm looking for in the county of Hindley, Hindley is a small area, but even with just a small population of 3,700, there are two churches, five independent chapels, and a Roman Catholic chapel. And so you want to be aware that you need to look at several churches unless you know the church that your family went to. But when you do go on to the website, you are able to look for certain years, and you can use their surname index, and that is all for free. So you can look a lot of this up for yourself for free and see if your family's on there, which is so great to have a valuable resource from England that is right here just using the computer. Yeah, absolutely. So then you're saying that all of them are online at this point? Um, a lot of them are, yes. Okay. And you can just look them up. What a great asset. And, of course, like you mentioned, you start triangulating a little bit with uh, probate records, and you get three generations knocked out very easily, work the maternal line, which is a lot more difficult typically in England. Let me ask you this, Suzanne. Uh, What made this whole thing end in 1812? Well, around that time, the Church of England decided that it didn't want all this information. People decided that the counties were becoming too big. They just didn't have the room to write all this down and record it and keep it going. It is a really valuable time to get that information because it's not till 1837 that the government finally says, hey, we're going to take over recording vital records and you're just going to do church things. And so the two separate. And so before 1837, everything is up to the churches, and, and they take over this, this register form. And then after that, we, we lose a lot of good information as England becomes really a country that doesn't just use the church to record vital statistics. All right. She's Suzanne Earnshaw. She's a project manager with LegacyTree.com. Thanks so much for the time and the tip, Suzanne. You bet. Thank you. And coming up next in three minutes, it's another listener question. Tom Perry, our preservation authority, will attempt to answer it. Coming up on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. And it is time to talk preservation on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. That's Tom Perry over there. He is our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. How are you, Tom? Good to see you again. I'm great. Boy, now we're getting down to it. It's getting close to the holidays, and everybody's thinking, wait a minute, how do I do this? And, and we have an email here from Karen Crawford, and she says, what is the raw format that was referred to on your website, Tom? I'm more concerned about quality than anything else. These are videos of my daughter when she was first born and will probably only have one chance to transfer because I'm sure the tapes are deteriorating. And she's probably right. What do you say, Tom? She is absolutely right. And about the holidays right now, it's Fisher Cup bait. Either get your stuff in or wait for January. That's one thing that's really interesting. We've had a lot of people ask about that because like your big box stores, the places where you throw everything in a box and mail it to some place, there's one option. It's VHS to DVD or VHS to MP4, and that's the only option they have because you got to realize that these people that deal in these huge volumes, they're just like General Motors. Right. You know, they have a certain way that they make the cars, and that's the way they come, either take it or leave it. I call it a run and gun. They pop the tape in, play it, and place like the big box stores – They have this big warehouse of cubicles, people just sitting there doing their transfers, and they're told if there's nothing up in five minutes, then just mark the tape blank and return it, because then they don't charge you anything, because all they did, they watch it for five minutes. Sure. And so that way, for them to waste any more time, it's not worth it for them. So what you're saying is there might be something further into a videotape that they're missing, and people are maybe throwing these out? Oh, absolutely. We have people in tears coming into our stores and say, hey, I have this VHS tape of our wedding. I took it to the big box store. They said it's blank. I don't have a VCR to check it. I'm just devastated. And so we take it from them, and maybe five, seven minutes in, the video starts. There's a whole bunch of black for some reason at the beginning. And then the video goes and plays for an hour and a half, and there's their wedding. You know what kills me is I know that there's somebody listening right now who has gone through this, and they're realizing, 
oh my gosh, there probably was something on my tape, and I threw it away. It's almost the opposite of buyer's remorse. Yeah. It's like, why did I even take it in? And the same thing with tapes that are damaged. They say, oh, your tape's damaged. Do you want us to throw it away, or do you want to come in and pick it up? 99% of the tapes that come into us that are damaged, we fix. There might be some blips in it and some glitches. But overall, the tape is usually salvageable. Even if you only get half of it, it's worth it than throwing it into your garbage can. Sure, of course. Like I say, 99% of the time, we can fix and at least get something off your tape. You know, we've had ones that have oil on them. We've had mold. We've had water. We've had mud damage, just like from Houston. And they think they're totally gone. They send them to us. We dry them out in distilled water. And everything runs in there great. We have special machines just for these tapes. So getting back to this question then, what is raw? Okay, raw is actually the second step up. The ones I talked about, which are put all your stuff in this box, send it to us, and we'll send you magically back DVDs. Or if you go to the big box store, they do what we call an eye transfer, which is the run and gun, where all you do is you put it in and run it. And we offer that service for the people that say, hey, I can't afford anything else, but I want to get something done, and I'd rather leave them with you or send them to you or one of the people that do like you do. But I'm not sending it off to Indiana. I'm not sending it off to California or Texas or, in some cases, sending stuff over into India. And it's pretty cheap. It's only like about seventeen ninety five for a two-hour tape. And it's better than nothing. Don't think, well, I really want the very best, so I'm going to wait forever. If that's the best you can do, get it done. Do it. And if you're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to buy a big screen TV or I've got my eye on this new pickup truck, what's more important really than preserving your past, making things available for your future, than having you know a cool truck in your driveway or a neat plasma TV on the wall? Well thought out there, Tom. And by the way, local people like Tom are in virtually every city in America. So look for people like Tom instead of the big box stores. What are we going to talk about next? We'll talk about the raw, which you mentioned, the PTS, the DVA. MP4s, the alphabet soup as you refer to it, and what's the best way to go and the most important disc to use. All right, coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. (laughs) 
We are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show on ExtremeGenes.com. You know, every show we wrap up with segments about preservation because preservation is the most important thing that you can do within your home, preserving your photographs and your videos and your home movies and whatever it is you may have. And it's got to be done right and it's got to be done safely. And that's why Tom Perry comes in every week to talk to us about this. This segment's brought to you by MyHeritage.com. Tom, getting back to the email, here you, you keep avoiding the answer to the question here <laughs> let's just repeat this what is the raw format that is referred to on your website this is from karen crawford because she's concerned about quality digitized videos of her baby when it was a newborn okay the most important thing you want to ask is what disc are they using because it doesn't matter if you back up all your stuff on these beautiful shiny discs and they have a three to five year shelf life that's not good you want to make sure you always use tile discs Make sure the person that's doing your transfer for you has Taoyudin discs. And we really prefer what we call real-time transfers. As your tape is playing, it's going directly to a disc. And that's what the RAW is. We go real-time transfer from the tape to the disc. We're not going through a computer that can cause glitches. And then once we get on the computer, then we burn the DVD. So depending how fast your computer is, how everything's working, it's not made to make things from analog to digital. It's made to process digital formats. So what you need to do is make sure you're getting the right kind of disk, you're getting the right kind of formats, because otherwise it's not going to do you any good. So basically what the RAW is, it's a step up from the I, which is what the big box stores do, where you put everything in a box and send it to them, and they send you disks back. With the RAW, if there are some basic adjustments, such as tracking and things like that, we will do it because we're actually watching your tape for the first few minutes and get everything set up. Is that what that means then? Right. It's basically a RAW transfer. It's like a steak. But you make sure there's no mold or anything on it. Right, so okay. It's, it's a good state. So you're watching it as it's transferring, as opposed to just throwing it in and zipping it off and then coming back, oh, it's done. Exactly. We look Next. at the first few minutes, and if we can see a problem there that's going to be easily corrected, we take care of it. If it's something major, we'll call you and say, hey, you've got some major errors here. We need to use a pro camp. We need to use a decipher to make your color better, to make the whole thing look better. And then if that's the case, you can say, no, that's fine. Just do the best you can. I want to pay the raw, which usually runs about $20 to $25 for a two-hour tape. Then if you get it to the next step, which we call the PTS, which is a personal transfer service, we watch more of your tape. If it needs a proc amp, we'll run the proc amp. If it needs a decipher, we'll automatically do that for you. If there's still any problems, we'll write it down on your work order so when you pick it up, we can go over with you and say, hey, you had these things. This might be some old film. Hey, do you have the original film? Bring that in. It's going to look so much better. So is this kind of a typical service of transfer centers around the country who specialize in this as you do, as opposed to the big box stores? Right, because most people offer the PTS. Sometimes your tape looks great, like you watched it or you can watch it in our showroom or most places you can take your tape to. They have a VHS machine where you can watch it. If it looks great, you know, save 10, 11 bucks and don't need to do that. You can just say, hey, transfer this to the raw process. That's the best way. But if you've got problems, like you got copies of copies of copies, and it's yeah. really degraded, it's been through water, it's been through floods, it's had damage to it, then you need to go to the personal transfer service where we can actually adjust more things to make it better for you. And then the next step would be the DVA, which is the next step. It's just a lateral type thing. That's if you want it on the cloud, you want just MP4s, or you want MP4s and DVDs, they can go to things like the DVA. But call us, ask us questions. If you're going to use a local guy, it's still fine to call us and ask us questions or write us, and we'll do everything we can to make sure you're asking the right questions so you can get the best transfer possible. All right, Tom. Sounds like a lot of options, which is good. Talk to you next week. Thank you. My pleasure. And coming up, by the way, this coming week for patron club members only, it's another bonus podcast. We're going to talk to photo expert Ron Fox about how he finds the rarest of photographs, including ancestral photographs and valuable historic photographs. We're going to cover all kinds of ground commercial free. So we hope you'll join us. Sign up for our patrons club at ExtremeGenes.com. Take care. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 